cheat sheet to D2L just so you can look at it. But this is what I will give to you on Thursday. Um, this will be, so you'll have the power series, the, these power series, so these are all given to you. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. And then this is the summary of the convergence test that I'm going to give you. So down to the retest. So not the entire convergence test, but <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I was trying to come up with a clever way to just list like the main part of the test, but not the conclusion. It was just a pain in the neck. Huh. So I figured I would just be more generous than less generous. So again, it's not every single thing. Converges if P is greater than one, so you know it's going to diverge if it's less than or equal to one. <laughs> it's like, you can fill in the blanks pretty easily. Um, so all that stuff will be on there. You can look at it tonight and tomorrow as you're studying just to make sure if there's anything that you need that's not on there to make sure that you put that in your mind. Okay, so let's get started with our, with our review. <laughs> yeah, quick question. Not really. I don't think so. The Monday after break. Oh, what was it? What was due? The 11.1? That's 12.1. No, yeah, that's just a mistake Monday. I, must have, I meant the Monday after that. So I'll, I'll take a look and switch that. Yeah, thanks. I will check that out. Uh, so same old stuff. No graphing calculator. And unfortunately, can't use these because these things are pretty darn powerful. And if everybody doesn't have one of these, then those that don't are at a disadvantage. So just the bonehead calculator. The no phones, no note cards. <laughs> no note cards, but you get the cheat sheet. Um, chapter 10, chapter 11, all that stuff. Let's go ahead and start doing questions. Oh, and also I mentioned to you last time, there's two sample tests up there on B2L. Look at those carefully. One of those tests has two extra credit questions. I will put both of those extra credit questions verbatim on this exam. So one of them is finding, dealing with the Coke snowflake, infinite perimeter, finite area. The other one is showing that the Riemann zeta sum is equal to the Euler product. If you look it up on the internet, you will find all the steps for both those proofs. So if you go and figure those out and can regurgitate it, then you get some extra credit. Wait, how many points is this going to be? Um, I had, that's a great question. Um, I don't, I was thinking of having each one worth three points. So that's essentially a whole letter grade if you got them both. Um, so I was thinking it was three. Um, so the easier one is the Coke Snowflake. <laughs> if you're going to just do one, do the Coke Snowflake. It's easier. Yeah, three, three is where I'm leaning right now. Uh, should we do one of these, or is this? I literally think that is the question on one of your exams. Oh yeah, this is definitely on one of them. So we should probably do it, huh? So we should probably do it, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a... Because it changes it. Definitely a good chance. 50-50 if you look at those two exams. Uh, do you know if there's a way for us to save the entire notebook that we have in the That is what I've been working on okay. this week. Okay. So I have figured out a way, because it's weird with this Windows, with this web version of OneNote, there's not an export option if you're using the version that we're using. But what I figured out last week was that I can take it and transfer it into my personal OneNote account. And my personal OneNote account, I can export it. So at the end of the semester, I will export the whole thing as a zip file, and you can download it. And then you'll have the entire semester with you. You don't need access to D2L or anything. Well, great question. Yeah, it's weird because we have some sort of uh, educational version, and if you have this bigger 
full-blown version, you would think exporting would be a natural option, <laughs> but it's not. But I can just transfer it to my personal account and export it. So it took me a while to figure that out. It but lets I, me do it, but it's only one page per PDF file, and that's just... Yeah, huh. yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. You can do that kind of thing. Yeah. Let's see. So it lets you do it from your personal account or from your school account? Yeah, from my personal account. Yeah, from your personal Let's account. Let's do all the pages as one. Yeah, the personal account you can export anything you want, but for some reason our our institutional account doesn't let us do that. So yeah, that will definitely be up and ready. So by the last day of class, you could download it and just have it. So uh, this says that we're dealing with prairie dogs. There's 260 of them, so P sub zero is 260. And then it says that these prairie dogs are reproducing, believe it or not, and that they are reproducing on a monthly basis. I think that it's off the screen, 1% right there. So at the end of each month, there's 1% more than you started the month with. So we start with that, and then after a month, we're going to have the number that we started with plus a percent of what we started the month with. We can factor out the 260 right here, and if we factor out the 260, we're left with 1 plus 0 0.01. So we get that. Now we're in month two. Do, 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 do. Month two, we're going to start the month with that number of prairie dogs, but then we are going to multiply that by 0.01 by to get the increase. So it's always going to be this pattern where we have initial plus the extras. Initial plus the extras. And the extras are always 0 0.01 multiplied by what you started the month with. So we started the month with 260 times uh, 1.01. We started with that. Now we can factor out the 260 times 0 0.1.01. .01. And when we factor that out, so we're going to factor out this quantity right there from both those terms. We factor it out of here, we're left with a 1. Factor it out of there, we're left with 0 0.01. Those add together to 1.01. .01. So we have another factor of 1.01, of .01, so now it's squared. And we keep on doing this. Let's do one more. So P sub 3, we're going to start the next month with this number of prairie dogs. And then we have to add the extras. And the extras are 0 0.01 multiplied by what we started the month with. Well, we've started the month with this number of prairie dogs. <coughs> Once again, we factor out the two, the, the common factor. And what are we left with? We are left with, we pull this out of here, we're left with a 1. Pull it out of there, we're left with a 0 0.01. So we have another factor of 1.01. .01. So this goes up to 3. Dot, dot, dot. What's P sub n? Perfect. Yeah, so it's a geometric series. If there was no constraints on these prairie dogs, how many would we end up with? Infinite. Infinite. The limit of 260 multiplied by 1.01 .01 to the n is infinity. Obviously, that's not going to be the case in the real world. So this can model the population growth for a period of time but at some point, this model is going to start to fail. It could work really well for a couple of years, but at some point, this model will fail. You'll need a new model. With biological populations, you usually use something called a logistic curve, and it will grow really fast, but then it tapers off, and it will have an asymptote, which I call the carrying capacity, and that's pretty typical for a population of animals, where there's going to be a limit to the size based on food, resources, getting run over by cars, things like that. Any questions on that?
Yeah, so if you want to, so you would just put these in, 260, type this into your calculator, round it, type that into your calculator, round it. If you wanted to know um, what the population approximately is equal to after 50 months, you would plug in a 50, type it into your calculator, round it to the nearest prairie dog. I had a quick question on P sub 2, on um, the part where you factored out the 1.01, 1 .01, it they came together and became the squared, but what happened to the plus 0 0.01? So this is just factor, like if you factor A out of this expression right here, if I factor A out, I'm left with 1 plus A. Uh -huh. So I factored this whole piece, and so I'm left with a 1 there. Mm -hmm. 1 plus 0 0.01 is another 1.01. Uh, okay, okay. So every time you factor out the common factor, you're left with 1 plus, one, one plus 0 .01. .01. So it becomes a 1.01. Okay. So each step of the way, it becomes an extra 1.01. .01. Okay. All right, let's go. Do you want to do a inverse relationship that that would be a, a sub n plus 1 equals a sub n multiplied? So, right, good, good point. So, yeah, if we wanted the recursive relationship, we're just taking whatever, the, whatever was there prior and multiplying it by 1.01. 1 .01. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, geometric series. Oh, no, not yet. Limit of this. Do we need to do this, or have we done enough of these? Up to you. How do we do it? We do it with the log limit. We let y equal that thing. We take the log of both sides, take the limit of both sides, turn it into L'Hopital. Just, just do it. Just do it. <laughs> you could. There is a shortcut here. You should know what it's going to converge to, but you still have to show it. But what should it converge to? Anyone know what that will converge to? It is a modified e, e to the You're going to multiply those two together. So that would be e to the 15. So that's what we're, we'll show with our process. So we let y. No. Well, you can, but <laughs> it depends on your goals. <laughs> yeah. So. And I'm going to give you one that's not going to be so perfectly in the E format. Natural log of both sides, limit of both sides. We've done this a bunch, so hopefully I can just cut to the chase like that. We're going to do the log of both sides and the limit of both sides. And when we take the log of the left, the uh, right hand side, we bring down the. And I just have to squeeze in my log right in there. I forgot the log. So we have that. Do you recommend rewriting inside the log so it's got a common denominator? Or is you know, you can do it. There's a piece of it that's faster if you do that. Okay. And there's a piece that's slower if you do that. So it kind of balances out. It's a little easier to take the derivative, because you know we're going to have to do the derivative with L'Hopital's. It's actually easier to take the derivative when it's not a single fraction. If it is a single fraction, then you have to use the quotient rule. So either, either way, it's totally fine. If you, want to get a, if you want to write this as x plus 5 over x, totally fine. Because that actually makes taking the reciprocal easier. When you do the derivative of a log, the first step is the reciprocal of what's inside. So let's rewrite this. So we're going to just shove the 3x into the denominator as a reciprocal. Another option is to pull the 3 to the outside and just flip the x down into the denominator. That will work fine also. Now we're in L'Hopital, the land of L'Hopital's rule. Derivative, top and bottom. So up top, the derivative is 1 over the inside times the derivative of the inside. So it's 5x to the negative 1. Bring down the negative 1, subtract 1. 
And down below, it's going to be negative 1 over 3x squared. Same idea. Think of that as 1 third x to the negative 1. Bring down the negative 1, subtract 1. Cancellation of the x squared. Cancellation of the minuses. So let's see what's left. So the 3 is going to pop into the numerator and give us a 15. Let's just leave this denominator this alone. And what is that limit? 15. 15. Because the 5 over x is going to 0. The left side is not quite what we want it yet, right? The left side is natural log of the limit of the function. So what do we do to both sides? Yeah, we're going to exponentiate so that we get the limit of y is e to the 15. That is the limit of this sequence. So this is a sequence that we're finding the limit of. No series here, sequence. Any step there that you need clarification on? You can factor out the 3 before shoving it. In mm hmm Absolutely. So right here, you could have pulled the 3 out and just made this 1 over x. Notice in the end, we had to multiply by 3 when we flipped it here. So you could have done it there, or you could have moved it out in front. Yeah. Either way, it's going to. Give us e to the 15th. <clears throat> what kind of sequence is this? Geometric sequence. We have an r to the k as the form. r to the n, r to the k. So the question next is, OK, this is a geometric sequence. We are repeatedly multiplying by negative 0.6. Will this converge or will this diverge? The magnitude of the common ratio is less than 1, so we have convergence. So the sequence converges, definitely converges. And what type of convergence is it? Are we converging monotonically? Monotonically means trending in one direction. Or are we converging by oscillating? By oscillating. Oscillating, exactly. So this is going to be that and that. And that's only because it's negative, right? Uh, yes. So if and it was like just 0 0.06, I'm sorry, 0 0.6, then it would be Monotonically. monotonically converging to uh, zero. zero. And this is converging to zero. <coughs> Matthew? If we had to find like the value of it, what, we would use like the one over, or a over one minus There's no one. value other than what it converges to. This is not a series. Oh, okay. okay. Right, this is a geometric sequence. So this sequence is just a bunch of dots doing this kind of thing. Converging around zero, converging to zero. That's if it's a series. Is that what you're saying? No, no. I was talking about this. So this. for a sequence, we just take the limit. And if the base is less than one in magnitude, okay. it converges to zero. If the base is larger than one in magnitude, converge or diverge. Diverge, diverge if the base is bigger than one in magnitude. Okay, yeah. Okay. What if the base is exactly one? What about if we had some weird oddball sequence like that? It's just one. So is it diverge or converge? Need more tests? Diverges. Diverges So let's see, what is this? But that's a series. No, this is not a series. I mean, the other Sequence. So, right, this is one, 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 one. And that is a convergent sequence, right? That's converging to 1. So it, if it was a series and you were adding 1 plus 1 plus 1, then that would diverge. But for a sequence, a sequence of uh, a number that's repeating is the, the limit of the sequence itself. 
Is that the only difference between the sequence and series? Is that there's some type of addition or something else aside from just something raised to the end? That's right. So a sequence is a list of numbers, and a series is the sum of that list of numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And would you have a show that, like, if you gave us that problem, the one above, just no. as long as we know it's zero? And uh, so we have, uh, you already know intuitively, one half times one half gets smaller. Yeah. 1.5 times 1.5 gets bigger. So that's sort of understood that you already get that fact. That a number less than one raised to itself is going to go to zero. A number bigger than one multiplied by itself will go to infinity. Yeah. So those are two basic limits that we accept at this point. Squeeze them. Should we do a quick squeeze theorem? So with a squeeze theorem type problem, you have to start with a fact. And the fact that we're going to start with is that we know for a fact that sine of n is somewhere between minus 1 and 1, including the endpoints. Right? Can't be outside of that interval. We know that fact. And then what we do is create in the middle whatever our a sub n is. So we divide through by 6n. Divide through by 6n. And then we take the limit of the whole thing. So let's kind of cut down on all the writing, I guess. So now we're going to take the limit of the whole thing. And this tells us that we have 0 less than or equal to the limit as n goes to infinity, sine n over 6n, less than or equal to 0. So what is our conclusion? 0. So this tells us that the limit of sine n over 6n is 0. Yes. So that's how we would do the squeeze theorem. So squeeze theorem, we've got to start with a known fact. Usually it's a sine or a cosine that's in between negative 1 and 1. That's the classic. Can you just go up with it? What's that, Matthew? Okay. Got it? Yeah. All right, so sequences. Another sequence, this is a recursive sequence. Now, with recursive sequences, there's a little bit of strangeness that happens. They are giving us this fact that this sequence converges. We had a theorem that says any bounded and monotonic sequence has to converge. So monotonic means that it's trending up or trending down. If it's monotonic and bounded in your mind, if it's, if it's an increasing sequence, if it's trending up and it's bounded, that means there's a ceiling. And if you have a sequence that's trending up with a ceiling, there must be a limit to that sequence. Similarly, if your sequence is trending down, it's got a floor if it's bounded, so it must also have a limit. Now, they didn't tell us how they concluded that it's monotonic and bounded. We don't care. This sequence converges. And this technique that we use for these recursive sequences that converge only works if the sequence converges. If the sequence diverges, what we're about to do is meaningless. But if we know that it converges, then we can do the following thing. We can take the limit of both <coughs> sides as n goes to infinity. So we'll take the limit of both sides and we are told that the sequence converges. The sequence on the left and the sequence on the right are essentially the same sequences. They're going to converge to the same number, which we'll call L. Now, n starts at 0, so you would say, oh, well, this sequence starts at 1, whereas this sequence starts at 0. It doesn't matter if this sequence has one less term. We know that you can chop off as many leading terms in a sequence as you want and not affect the convergence or divergence. 
So it doesn't matter that, these, that this sequence here is one less term. It doesn't matter. And again, this only works if we know that the sequence converges. So we get that. The limit operator can squeeze through continuous functions. So we can just push it inside the square root. And the limit of this a sub n is l. And then we square both sides and subtract the stuff on the right to the left. We factor. We have a couple of possibilities. So this says that L could be negative 3 or 4. But we look at our sequence and there is no way the limit of this can be a negative number. Because as soon as we, we plug in our negative 12 to get our next term, next term is 0. Now we plug in 0 there, square root of 12 is 2 root 3. So the only time that the sequence has a term that's negative is this first term. After that, we're dealing with positive square roots. So this sequence could never converge to a negative. Because all the terms become positive once you hit a sub 2. They'll stay positive. So this one is not really a candidate. So that means that the limit of this sequence is 4. But it only works if the sequence converges. And any questions? All right, what kind of sequence, what kind of series, now we're to series, what kind of series is that? A what? Nope. Geometric. 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 I don't know. Because <laughs> it's one or the other, those are the two series that we always confuse, P series and geometric series. Like one over something. Like yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of things. So with a geometric series, we want it to be in that r to the k form. Mm -hmm. So or r to the j in this case, because we're using a j instead of a k. So you can think of it like that. You can think of breaking apart that exponent so it looks more like that. j is going to start at 1. So when we starting at 1, if we figure out that base, that's 1 over 81 raised to the j power. So what is the common ratio here? 1 over 81, that's less than 1, which implies convergence. And what is the a value? 1 over 81. So the a value is the very first term in the series. We find the very first term in the series by plugging in the initial index. So we plug in the 1, we get 1 over 81. So that tells us this is one of those rare series that we can actually find the sum of. So it's a divided by 1 minus r. So our s will be 1 over 81 divided by 1 minus 1 over 81. Whoops. And if we multiply through by 81, we have that. And that tells us that the sum of this series is 1 over 80. So this is a very broad question. Oh, how exciting. Um, so we know for like geometric series, it like does not matter which index you start with because you'll come up with the same answer whether it's 1 or 0. That's not quite true. It's not. No. So if you, so a geometric series, if you're trying to find the sum of a series. That, sorry, that is what I mean. But wait, what are you saying? So if you're, if you're finding the sum of a series, if you chop off some terms, then it's going to converge to a different number. Okay. For a series. Okay. For a so sequence, if you chop off some terms, it doesn't matter. Right. But so for a series, if you chop off some terms, maybe you're answering my question there. In which cases does it matter which 
in bits we start with? So it matters with a geometric series in the sense that when we're trying to find A, if this started at 0, what would the A value be? 1. one. So then down here, we would have 1 over 1 minus 1 over 81. Uh -huh. okay. So what about if this started so at, re at indexing J? We that could re-index also. And then you would get the same value. Still, right? Yeah, so if, we, so if we wanted to re-index this, we could. Let's start this at 0, just for grants. So this is starting with j equals 1. What would I replace j with so that it would start at 0? Uh, j plus 1. J plus 1. So if I put a j plus 1 right where that j is, subtract 1 from both sides of this tiny equation, we'd have j equals 0. So we're replacing j with j plus 1. So then up here we have a j plus 1. So and now. The a are to the k form. So now it's not in the same form. Now it's not really in the proper form. Can you pull off a 1 to make it 1? Yep, we could do that. Absolutely. So even though it's not in the proper form, you can still find a and r pretty easily up there. So now it's really in the arc form. J is starting at zero. Okay, so now has anything changed? What's your A? Right, if you plug in your index, zero, this goes away. So you have one over 81 for A, and your R value is still one over 81. So re-indexing does not change the sum of the series. Okay. But if you just change where it starts, so you've chopped off some terms, then it does okay. change the series. So I guess my question is, when should you re-index? Are there any cases where you have to? Um, no. So, so that's not exactly re-indexing. So that's adjusting your index based on the derivative or the integral. How do I know where I should index? So, uh, so we'll get to the derivatives when we get to chapter 11. So re-indexing. Um, that's kind of why I said it was a broad question because it's kind of like over everything we've learned. Re-indexing has to happen if you're trying to add two series together. You want them to start at the same place. Okay. So if you have two series that you're trying to combine with addition or subtraction, then you need to re-index if they're not already set to match each other. Okay. And I actually had it in my mind that in chapter 11 we were going to see that, and we actually haven't. In the older versions of the book, they would do some problems where you had to add two series together, and then you'd have to re-index. But actually, we haven't come across a case where we had to re-index. Okay. I mean, like this is probably the closest we've had. The technical form of a geometric series is starting at 0, a, r to the k. So putting it, if you want to put it in a really formal geometric form, then you, you, know, then you could re-index. Okay. But you don't have to. Like we've seen a, a lot this semester that this could start at 5. We don't know to re-index it down to zero. We would just say, oh, well, to find a, I'm going to plug in a five. So you still could find the first term and the common ratio without re-indexing. So you don't have to. Yeah. So it's in that form, in the arc form? In the arc form? What did you say? The arc form. What about it? Um, I was looking at a lot of the examples in the book, and a lot of times they were saying that if you take any not first term, and divide it by another term, you would get, in this case, you get 1 over 81. But yes. Is it always true that whatever is in the parentheses, if it's in the correct form, is that value? Is the ratio. Okay. Yes, always. And so what you just said was this. So if you're looking at your terms, if you call the first one a sub 0, and then you have a sub 1 times r, and then a sub 2 times r squared, what you just said was that if you take the ratio of these terms, if you take consecutive terms and form the ratio, you will always get your r. So if you, oh, and I, I want to change this. This should not be subscripted because you're only multiplying by r. So you start with that first term, multiply by r, multiply by r, so the a's are all the same. The coefficients are all the same there. And right, if you take this and divide it by that, don't you get r? And so that's what that was saying, that if you take any two consecutive terms in the geometric series and do this division, you'll get R. And that's literally because if you um, are thinking about how you get from one term to the next, you're constantly multiplying by R. So if you take this and divide by that, you'll be left with the R. So 
So if you're if you're given just that and not the original submission, mm -hmm. that's how you can get there. Yes. Yeah, so if you were given something that's geometric, let's suppose we have something like 2 plus 2 times, um, let's make the common ratio, uh, let's, let me see, let me just think in my head for a second, let's make the common ratio so that it does this. So from there you can tell, what is the A value and what is the R value? Our R value is one third and the A value is two. So the sum of this series is two over one minus one third. Multiply by three. And we get that would be the sum of that series. And you won't have us put anything into summation? Or are there going to be some? Um, I don't think any. Okay. Yeah, going. I mean, when I say that, I'm especially talking about trying to. A lot of times the book has these things where they want you to identify the function. So they want you to take the infinite series, turn it into summation notation, and then identify the function. That is very hard. There are so many other things that we have to learn that, that that's just a little extra difficult and not necessary. Okay, how about that thing? So telescoping series. Do we do one of those, or do you feel like do one? Okay, so let's. So the idea with the telescoping series is that we first need to, if it's not given in the telescoping form, we have to use PFD to get it in the telescoping form. So we're going to take that. And the PFD that we use is always going to be a pretty simple PFD. We're not going to embed a PFD that's really complicated into a series problem. There's already enough going on, so the PFD part should be pretty easy. Can we, we start with k equals zero instead of k equals one, just so it's a little more complicated? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so that's a great point because when we have the index starting at one, the n value and the k value align, so there's no thinking about that. That's, so yeah, we'll, get, we'll do that. <clears throat> Let's make this zero then. Let's just start it at zero. <clears throat> okay, so first let's do our PFD. We multiply both sides by the denominator on the left. We've seen this a bunch. So this will be our equation that we could use convenient values for. Or we could go the traditional method. It does not matter. When you're in series and you stumble across the PFD, it's always going to be possible to use convenient values. There's never going to be an irreducible quadratic in this context. So do you want to do convenient values or traditional method? Doesn't matter. Convenient values. Convenient values, OK. So we're going to let k equal negative 2 thirds. That's our first convenient value method, our first convenient value. Plug in negative 2 thirds there, we get 0. Plug in negative 2 thirds here, we get negative 3b. So this tells us that b is negative 3. <clears throat> What's the other convenient value? One third. one third. So plug in 1 third at the end, that's going to go away. So we plug in 1 third there, we get 9 is equal to 3a. So a is equal to 3. So now. We can write our summation in telescoping form. So it's 3 divided by 3k minus 1 minus 3 divided by 3k, was it plus 2? 3k plus 2. And we're going to start this one at 0 to make it a little more complex. <coughs> Now, the 3 in the numerator could factor out to the front, and we could deal with it later, or we could just leave it in. It does not matter at all. Let's just leave it in. So our S sub n, that's the sum of the first n terms. Sum of the first n terms. So the first term is found by plugging in k equals 0. 
So I'll put the end down below, and let's put the k's up top. So the k value for n equals 1 is 0. And our goal is to add up the first n terms. So we plug in k equals 0, and we're going to get 3 divided by negative 1 minus 3 divided by 2 plus. Now we're going to plug in k equals 1, and we're going to get 3 divided by 2 minus 3 divided by 5. So let's make sure we're clear here. So we plugged in k equals 1. We have now found our second term. So if we added those two terms together, that would be s sub 2. s sub 2 is the sum of the first two terms. So to get to our next term here, we are going to plug in k equals 2. So we plug in k equals 2, and we get 6 minus 1 is 5. Minus 2 there is 6 plus 2 is 3 eighths. Plus dot dot dot. Okay, so now that's our third term. That was found by plugging in k equals 2. And we want to go to the nth term. So we're going to look at the n minus first term and the nth term. But because this started at 0 and not 1, it's not that we're going to plug n minus 1 in to here to get the n minus first term. If we look at our pattern, the corresponding k is 1 less than the term value. So what are we going to plug in here for k? n minus 2 and n minus 1. So we just have to keep that pattern up. So if we are going to add up the first n terms, that means k is going to go from 0 to n minus 1. That will give us the first n terms. So we come down here, plug in n minus 2 right into there. So if we plug in n minus 2, that's 3n minus 6. Minus 1 is 3n minus 7. I'll need a little bit of space here for these. And then plug in n minus 1 there. We have 3n minus 3 plus 2 is 3n minus 1. We plugged in n minus 1 or n minus 2? We did um, n minus 2. Right? We should, I think we, we actually did. Yeah, we should be plugging in n minus 2. Did I not plug okay. in n minus 2? <laughs> I might not have. Um, let's see. So we're plugging in n minus 2 here. We get 3n minus 6. So that's 3n minus 7. Plug in 3n minus 2 here. 3n minus 6. So this should be 3n minus 4. I did that one incorrectly. Now for the last term, we're going to plug in n minus 1. So we have 3n minus 3 minus 1 is 3n minus 4. So 3n minus 4 is the denominator here. 3 is the numerator. Plug it into the second one. We have 3n minus 3, so we end up with 3n minus 1. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it can get a little confusing. We have to remember we're plugging in the k values, not the n values. n is just counting the terms. So it doesn't matter what k starts with. k could start at 6. If k started at 6, so let's just suppose that k started at 6. Let me use the gray like I have down there. If k started at 6, this would still correspond to n equals 1. And then this would be 7, 8, dot, dot, dot. This would be 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. And then we have n minus 1 and n. What's the k value going to be for this n minus 1? N plus, n plus 4. Because what's the pattern? Add 5, add 5, add 5, add 5. So we just have to figure out what the pattern is with the k's and how the k's correspond to the n's. Okay, so let's complete our S of n up here. So S of n 
when we look at our cancellation pattern, we see that second goes with first, second goes with first, second will go with first in the dots. That's going from left to right. Now we change our perspective. We want to go from right to left. We can start right here. Going right to left, we see that, okay, going right to left, the first cancels with the second of the prior. So come over here, and first is going to cancel with second of the prior. And then first is going to cancel with second of the prior somewhere in the dots. So the only terms that are left are the negative 3 right there and that, negative 3 over 3n minus 1. So here is our s sub n. And what would s be? S is the limit of S of n minus 3. So this series will add up to minus 3. All right, any other questions with that one? Telescoping series. Pretty fun. All right, divergence test. So we have to take the limit of a sub k, or in this case it's a sub n. Doesn't matter if it's an n or a k. <coughs> Oh, look at this, they've mixed it together. <laughs> they say a sub k there, but then they have n's up there. Ooh. All right, so let's take the limit of this. So we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity of root n over natural log 8n. And what are we going to use to take that limit? L'Hopital. It's indeterminate. This is infinity over infinity. So that means we can use L'Hopital. So we'll get the limit as n goes to infinity. <coughs> derivative of numerator. What's the derivative of that numerator? One half n to the negative one half. One half n to the negative one half. So we can write it like that. What's the derivative of the denominator? So 8 over 8n, which will then turn into just a 1 over n. So the derivative of a, of a natural log, 1 over the inside, multiplied by the derivative of the inside. So you're always going to get this funny cancellation if it's not just n in there. So then we have limit of, let's see, what's left? We have n over 2 square root of n. How can we combine those n's? Subtract. You can subtract exponents. You have n to the 1 over n to the half. So that's n to the 1 minus 1 half, which is n to the half, so it's that. You could also say to yourself that n is equal to root n times root n, and then one of them will cancel. <coughs> and what's that limit? Infinity. Most importantly, this limit is not zero, which tells us that we have divergence. So if the limit of a sub n is not zero, instantly you know it diverges. So that is the divergence test. If the limit's not zero, it can't converge. Yeah. And now if the limit is zero, that doesn't mean that the series converges, it just means 
that the series might converge. It means that the di divergence test is inconclusive. Because you can have limits that are zero and still have divergent series. Obviously. The very first series we looked at, the harmonic. The limit of a sub k is zero, but it diverges by integral test or p-series. <coughs> OK, so this says use ratio test. Now here we would have to create the summation notation, but this is a little different than what you were asking. I still am not going to put this on there, but this one is an easy enough one that you should be able to come up with the pattern. The, if you start looking in the denominator, you see that we have repeated multiplication by, looks like six. six. And we would, you know, clearly six times six is 36. And most of us can see in our head that this is 216. We should double check. Six times 216 is going to be that. It is. The numerator is a little trickier. 32, isn't that? 2 to the 5. It's 2 multiplied by itself 5 times. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 yep. times 4 is 16. 16 times 2 is 32. How about 243? Hmm. So 243, if you had to factor it, you know it's divisible by 9 because the sum of the digits is 9. So this is, that's one thing you could start with. You could say, okay, this is 9 times, 9 goes into there twice, that's 18, 963, so it's 9 times, um, what did I just say? 9 goes into there 2 times, so it's 27, right? 9 times 27. Both of those are powers of 3. This is 3 squared and 3 cubed, so then we see that, oh, 243 is 3 to the fifth. Now we probably see the pattern. To confirm the pattern, what are we expecting 1024 to be? Four to the fifth. Four to the fifth. Let's just double check. Type it in your calculator. Four to the fifth. Just to confirm it. So our k will start at 1, go to infinity, and we have k to the fifth divided by uh, 6 to the k. So that would be our base of k. Yeah. Uh, what trick did you do there where you said the 243, or how did you do that? I said that the sum of the digits is 9, and for divisibility by 9 or 3, if the sum of the digits is divisible by 9 or 3, then the number is divisible by 9 or 3. Okay. And how did you get the 27 part? So I, I divided 9 into 243. 9 goes into 24 twice, leaving 6, and then 9 goes into 63 seven times. So just long division. Or maybe it's not even called long division. It's just called division. <laughs> division. Long division has an X in it, right? So ratio test. So ratio test says the limit as k goes to infinity. A sub k plus 1 over a sub over 6 to the k plus 1. Oh, divided by a sub k, which means multiplied by the reciprocal. We don't need any absolute values here. Everything is positive. Looks like there's an extra 6 somewhere. Where is the extra 6? Yeah, so down in the denominator, so let's pull it out as a 1 sixth. So that would take care of the uh, 6 to the k plus 1 and the 6 to the k. That's 1 sixth. Now we have k plus 1 to the 5 over k to the 5. So that's k plus 1 over k quantity to the 5. And what is that limit as k goes to infinity? Yeah, so this is going to be 1 sixth times 1 to the fifth. 1 to the 5th is not indeterminate. 1 to the infinity is indeterminate. So we end up with 1 6th. And that is, what does that mean? Less than 1. Less than 1, which means convergence. So therefore, it converges. 
So ratio test and root test and geometric series, less than one means convergence, bigger than one means divergence, and equal to one for ratio or root means inconclusive. We said one because it's in the open uh, well, oh, no, 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 no. so this limit, raising something to the fifth power is a continuous function, x to the fifth is continuous, so the limit can push inside, and the limit of the inside, you take the ratio of leading coefficients, or you divide everything by k, and so we'll get the limit is 1 for the base, and 1 to the 5 is not indeterminate, 1 to the 5 is 1. I think you had a real quick question, but I think you kind of sure. just answered what I was thinking. The k plus 1 over the k, you're looking at it as just k over k, infinity over infinity, which is 1, right? That's Not because it's infinity over infinity, but because the powers match, we took, take the ratio of leading terms, ratio. leading coefficients. Okay. So the other way is that if you have k plus 1 over k, you could divide everything by k, and then this part here is going to go to zero, so the whole limit's going to go to one. Yeah, so that's the process. Root test. So with the root test, we're going to take the limit, and we're taking the kth root of a sub k. So we can draw that with a big radical. You can use just an parentheses with the 1 over k, whatever lets you vote. So, we have that. And I, oh, I just made one little, well, I haven't made the mistake yet, I guess, but what's true with the root test and the ratio test, we have to make sure that we are dealing with absolute values. If things could be negative, is, could anything in there be negative? No, so I guess I don't have to do any absolute values. Just like on the last one with the ratio test, if there was a chance that we had some negatives in there, then we would do absolute values. But there wasn't. For a moment there, I was thinking that there could be a third. Definitely no negatives. So we don't have to deal with absolute value. Get that. Okay. It looks a little like an E thing, but the form of the E limit that we've looked at is 1 plus uh, A over K to the BK. We know that that's going to be E to the AB. That's definitely not what we have in there. But you could do a little clever division. You could say, if you wanted to try to put it in this form, and again, this isn't proving it, but if you wanted to, um, you could do this. You could rewrite this just if you wanted to see if you could put it in a form recognizable as an E. So that's going to be 1 minus 1 over k plus 1 to the 5k. So if you had it written in that form, what do you think the limit might be? E to the 5, the negative 5? E to the negative 5? Yeah. All right, let's check. Certainly, if that plus 1 was not there, it would be E to the negative 5. As you take, it's always 1 plus, so that minus you can imagine in here as a negative 1 negative 1 times 5. So the question is, does the k plus 1 change? Or does 1 over k and 1 over k plus 1 go to 0 at the same rate? And does it do what we would expect it to do if the 1 wasn't there? So let's check. So we take our function, which was k over k plus 1. Uh, let's change it to x's. So we have x divided by x plus 1 all to the 5x. So there's our function. Log limit of both sides. 
So we're going to take the log of the limit of y. That's going to be the limit of the log. And over here, when we take the log, we're going to pull down the exponent. So we have this. Now with the last one, we shoved the whole coefficient in front. This time, let's pull out the 5, just to do it a little differently. And let's just push the x into the denominator as a reciprocal. Does everybody agree that that's in L'Hopital's form? We have 0 over 0. In the numerator, you get natural log of 1 when you take the limit of this, and natural log of 1 is 0. So now we do L'Hopital. So it's 5 times limit. The derivative of the numerator, 1 over the inside. That means reciprocal. Derivative of inside. It's a quotient. So we do low d high minus high d low over low squared. And then in the denominator, the derivative is minus 1 over x squared. And let's come up here. So we have 5 times the limit. So do you all see that this numerator just becomes 1? We have x plus 1 minus x, so that's 1. So let's write out what we have. We have x plus 1 over x. This becomes 1 over x plus 1 squared. Flipping this becomes negative x squared over 1. Canceling where we can cancel, we end up with minus x over x plus 1. And what is that limit? Negative 1. So negative 5 once we multiply by the 5. <coughs> now the left side still has the log on it. We have to unravel the log. Roll the log. So therefore the limit of y as x goes to infinity is e to the negative 5, 1 over e to the fifth. And that's what Joseph suggested already, that adding that 1 in the denominator probably doesn't change things. So what's our conclusion? What do we compare this to? One. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> We're trying to analyze whether the series converges or diverges using the root test. Yeah. Yeah. So do we get converge or diverge? So this is less than 1, which means converge. <laughs> These problems can be so long that you forget what you started with. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. yeah, that's funny. All right, let's take our break. Break. Ready? Break. Continue on our merry way towards chapter 11. Comparison test. Dun, dun, dun. Comparison test. What do we think we're going to compare to here? What's the dominant part of the denominator, the 7x or the 4, 3 to k? 7. Yes, that is the dominant part. So we would choose to try this v sub k, which if we pull out the 1 7, does this converge or diverge in y? What was that? Because it's 1, the p series. So this, so p is equal to 1, which implies divergence. Or you could say that it's the harmonic, and we know that the harmonic diverges by, uh, by integral test. Or you could think of it as a p-series. If p is bigger than 1, it converges. If it's less than or equal to 1, it diverges. I thought p why did we choose that over, uh, like, why did we choose that? Because this 
is a polynomial, and that is a root function. So a root function grows to infinity <coughs> slower than a polynomial will. So this first term is dominating the second term. Okay. And I'm sorry, with the P series, I thought it had to be an exponent. The exponent is one. Oh, okay. So P equals one. So if it's greater than one in a P series, you have convergence. Less than or equal to one, you have a divergence. You have divergence. <coughs> So will the direct comparison test work? We should be able to, we have enough mathematical maturity now that we should be able to just look at it and decide. If we are subtracting in the denominator, we are making the denominator smaller. So we're making the fraction bigger. Is that what we want in order to show convergence? Or to show divergence, I mean. Yes. Because that means that the inside of this is bigger than the inside of that. And if this one diverges, that one must diverge. So what we would want to show, so we know that we could actually make this work. So we want to show that our a sub k is bigger than the b sub k that we chose over there. <coughs> so we are curious about our a sub k. We want to know, is it bigger than the b sub k? We'll go with the original b sub k, not the way I rewrote it to convince us what it, the diver, that it diverged. So there is the b sub k. Multiply. <coughs> and these will cancel out. And let's just add that other thing, the 4 through to k. Let's add it to the right just to get rid of negative numbers. So we have that. And right there, you could jump out. You could say that's true. Or you could raise both sides to the fourth power if you really want to get down to something that is really obvious by inspection to a fifth grader, a fifth grader that's not on that TV show. <laughs> then we could take the fourth, we could raise both sides to the fourth power. So this is true. And so that means that uh, we have, that implies that we have divergence by direct comparison test. How's that feel? It's wrong to look at 1 over k and say, well, k is getting infinitely larger, therefore it goes to 0. Up here? To the, on the right. Over there? Yeah. That's just demonstrating that the divergence test is inconclusive. Uh, uh, right? So okay. if the limit of a sub k is 0, that means it might <coughs> converge or it might diverge. You have to do further investigation. So you, you kind of just saw that and then skipped that entirely and went straight to P-series? Well, because it is a P-series. If you have a P-series, if, if you have a geometric series or a P-series where you have instant ability to an analyze, you don't really have to think about the divergence test. Right? If it's in a P-series form, you either converge or diverge based on P. If you have a geometric series, you converge or diverge based on R. So you don't really have to combine the divergence test with those two. With the geometric series and the p-series, you know, you're comparing right instantly. You don't have to do anything. You're comparing right away, whether your p is bigger than 1 or your r is less than 1. So yeah, so that converges. Oh, excuse me. So that diverges by direct comparison. Direct comparison. Let's get out of 10. All right, so alternating series. I'm going to just rewrite this, emphasizing that the switch is separate from a sub k. So for, the, for an alternating series, a sub k doesn't include the switch. So a sub k is everything but the negative stuff. 
alternating series test. Step one is basically the divergence test. We take the limit of a sub k. And what is that limit? Zero. So then we continue to step two. So this checks. That checks. We need to show that the limit is zero. This still doesn't mean the series converges. It just means it might converge. It could still diverge. We don't know yet. I mean, maybe we know based on some other information, but that is not enough to tell us anything about convergence. It just says it, it, if that's not zero, then we know it doesn't diverge instantly. But it's still good. So now we want to show that the sequence of terms is decreasing. So we want to show that. That as we go tiptoeing out further into the series, the magnitude of the terms is shrinking. Less, 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 towards zero. So our a sub k, let's just do it up here. So a sub k is 8 over k to the 8 plus 2. We want to show that the next term, which is 8 over k plus 1 to the 8, plus 2. We can divide away the 8's. Division. We can multiply both sides. Multiply both sides. We can subtract off the 2's. We can Take the eighth root of both sides, and then we can subtract k. Get all the way down here to something that's true. So that tells us that the series what? Got it. The convergence. Is the so the magnitudes of the terms are decreasing, and we already found that the limit is zero, so we could say the terms are, the magnitude is decreasing to zero, which means convergence. You know what I said? What's that? No. You said diverge. <laughs> so that implies converge. So both steps of the alternating series test are true. I don't know the work right, but I won't know if the convergence is right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if we couldn't simplify that, then we could just take the derivative of that. If it's negative, then slope There's a whole bunch of weird things that can happen with that. So that will work if the gap between the two is decreasing, that would also absolutely work if you did this minus this and showed that it's decreasing. That would absolutely work. It doesn't always work because sometimes that gap uh, isn't, it's go, it's, sometimes the gap's not shrinking. There can be some other things that happen, but yes, in general, yes. What is talking about the derivative? Yeah, the derivative, oh. yeah. So the derivative, so the gap, by gap, I mean, if you did this minus this, then you're measuring the gap between the two. Okay. And so that gap, if you have a derivative that's negative, that means that that gap is shrinking, which means that this inequality is true. Okay. Yeah. So you had to find the derivative of both sides? Well, we're not, you're not going to have that on the test. So that's, yeah. Okay, so let's ask one more question. If you have an alternating series that converges, you can classify the convergence. You can classify the convergence as absolute or conditional. So once we have convergence for an alternating series, we can say, well, well, is this convergence conditional or is it absolute? So what would I do to determine this? What, would, what series am I going to look at? So all we're going to do is ditch the switch. Ditch the switch, and that will be the absolute value. So we have 8 over k to the 8 plus 2. So we have to consider that. If that series also converges, then we can say that this convergence is absolute. 
If this series of absolute values diverges, then we would say that this convergence is conditional. And what do we think about that series? Yeah, we think it's going to converge because of the k to the 8. Now, technically, we would need to do a, a, a comparison test. So what are we going to compare it to? Uh, over k to the 8. 1 over k to the 8. Let's see if that works. Maybe we have to put in an 8 up there if the inequality doesn't work exactly right. But this ha is a p series. p is 8, bigger than 1, therefore converge. So let's see. So we would want to show that our a sub k is less than the b sub k, correct? If this one converges and our original is smaller, then it must also converge. And I'm already seeing that, hey, why, why don't we just be careful and put an 8 here? Because when we put the a when we put the a sub k on this side and we put the b sub k on this side, if we have an 8 in both, we can just cancel them out. And this doesn't change the convergence, right? This is just 8 times the series 1 over k to the 8. So it doesn't change the fact that that series converges. And that seems like it might be just a little bit cleaner because then we can say, oh, divide both sides by 8 cross multiply, and we're golden. So now we have 0 less than or equal to 2. That's true. True. So that implies that what is true? So that tells us that this series converges. And our big therefore would be, therefore, we have absolute convergence. So that's our big conclusion because the original series converged and the series of absolute values also converged. So then it's absolute convergence. Series of absolute values converged. So here's another one, kind of just like that. Let's just talk through this one. Let's not go all the way through it. Let's at least just rewrite this again so that the switch is neatly pulled off and put in front so it doesn't interfere with what we're analyzing for our a sub k. OK, so for this alternating series to converge, we ignore the switch. Is the limit of a sub k 0? Yeah. Definitely, right? The limit of that, denominator is going to infinity, its fraction is going to zero. Are the terms decreasing in value? If you were to graph that function, this is just one of these things like that, you could show that a sub k plus 1 is less than a sub k very easily. Okay, now, so this is going to converge by alternating series test. How about this series. So now let's consider the series of absolute values. The series of absolute values is a p series. And what is the value for p? And what do we compare that to? So it's convergence. So what is this convergence then? Is this absolute or conditional? Yeah, so that's going to be absolute convergence because the series of absolute values also converges. So about absolute <laughs> I think I know what you're going to ask. When we have a power series with an x, and we take, when we do the root test, we take the, the absolute value of x minus 1 and divide it by the absolute value. So are we technically finding the i absolute? Yes. So, when it, so in the ratio and the root test for power series, we're doing the ratio test and the root test. We're absolute valuing it because of the x's. Mm -hmm. So we're putting in those absolute values. So we are testing for absolute convergence. And they don't really talk about it that way, but that is what we're doing. <coughs> we are testing for absolute convergence. And there is a, another theorem that says if you do have a series that converges absolutely, then the series that had the minuses must also converge that if you have absolute convergence, then you also have convergence. 
So you could be clever here and say, hey, I kind of know what's going on. I'm going to come down here and say the series of absolute values converges, which implies the series without the absolute values also converges. You could be clever and use that theorem. If the series of absolute values converges, you have absolute convergence, which implies regular convergence. So the, oh. If, if it converges conditionally. Yeah, that, it, it won't happen. It can't happen. There's another thing that they proved that shows that absolute value, absolute convergence in that ratio, that there's no other options. So literally with the power series, if you're in the interval of convergence, you have convergence. And if you're outside, you have divergence. There's no weird conditional stuff going on with power series. But that's a good point that, based on what we've seen, it feels like it, it could be something. All right, so let's go to chapter 11. Let's go through the construction process of Taylor polynomials, which are also used to build Taylor series. So let's just build our Taylor polynomial by taking some derivatives. They t ask us to go to p sub 2. Um, I think I'll just build p sub 3. Usually we want, and on the test I'll say, what are the first four non-zero terms? So usually we go to the first four non-zero terms. So we start out with a derivative. Well, let's start out with our function. The derivative. The derivative. The derivative. Derivative of cosine is negative sine, so we're back to sine. So now we've done the whole cycle. The next one will be this, and then this, and then this, and then this. So it's going to have a cycle of four. Now we have to do this. There's no shortcut when our center is something other than zero. So if we don't have a center of zero, we can't use those 10 top power series. If we're doing a Maclaurin series where the center is zero, we can modify one of those existing series that you're going to be given for the test. If you don't have a center of zero, you have to go through this process. There's no other way. So then we take our uh, center, and we're going to evaluate all of these at our center. Cosine of negative 5 over 4 is root 2 over 2. And then we are going to do f prime of that. So f prime sine of negative pi over 4 is negative root 2 over 2. Multiply by negative 1, we get positive root 2 over 2. And then f double prime. Cosine of negative pi over 4 is positive root 2 over 2. Multiply by negative 1. And then f triple prime. It's going to be negative root 2 over 2. All right, so those are the evaluation of the coefficients. We can now build our series. So our series, let's just call it P, P of x. So we have square root of 2 over 2. That much would be called P sub 0, the zeroth order Taylor polynomial. Now if we add root 2 over 2 and multiply by x minus a minus pi over 4, we get that. That is p sub 1. It's the first order Taylor polynomial. And if we keep on trucking, we go to this next coefficient. Here's where we start to see some extra stuff. We have to divide by 2 factorial. That is p sub, there's p sub 0, that's p sub 1, all the way up to there is p sub 2. <coughs> if we do one more, this will be minus root 2 over 2 times 1 over 3 factorial, x plus pi over 4 to the 3. <coughs> That is p sub 3. 
And if we go plus dot, 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 then we have the infinite series. We have the Taylor series. We have the full infinite polynomial. So P0, P1, P2, P3 would be out to there. Now they asked us to approximate, so let's just focus on this one, the quadratic approximation, at point zero point, negative 0 0.19. So let's do that. Let's come over here. So P sub 2 of negative 0.19 pi. So if you were asked to do this, I'm not going to ask you to do something quite this messy to plug into your calculator. But all you would do is plug this into your calculator. So we go out. So p sub 2 means we go out to the second power. So that's minus root 2 over 4. Plug in negative 0.19 pi right there. And that's raised to the 2. So if you type that into your calculator, you can get an approximation. On the test, if you have something like this, I'll tell you, go to four decimal places, go to two decimal places, whatever it is. Wait, they call this the quadratic, right? This is the quadratic approximation, yes. Quadratic approximation will be the power two Taylor polynomial. Yep. And P1 is the linear approximation. P1 is what you did back in Calc 1, it's a tangent line. P2 is the best parabola, that's parabolic approximation. P3 are we is... going to P2 or... Say again? Are we only going to P2? That, well, this, that's what this asks for. So, oh, okay. so here's the Taylor series is everything. Yep. If we wanted the approximation from P1, we would just plug it in here. If we want the approximation for P2, we plug it in there. So here I plugged it in for P2, and did anyone type that in? <laughs> yeah, whatever. So, it is whatever it is. I trust that you can do that part. That's a Desmos one right there, man. Yeah, exactly. I won't give you anything that complicated. The one on the quiz one is P5 or P6. Yeah, when you're sitting at home, lounging around, you know. She said the quiz, I guess. Did you get lost? What, oh, they just wanted P5 in that one, so you didn't have to type it all in. Okay. They wanted the whole thing out up to P5. Say that again. Point what? So you have to start from P0 to get the whole thing out for it to be ready. What's that? Zero, zero. Zero, zero here? Yeah. Okay. Two, seven, eight, and then two. Okay. And, I'm not like and also tell me, Natasha, if you plug in this, what do you get? Cosine of negative 0.19 pi. Is it like a one of those non-zero questions? 0.827. 0.827 what? 7080. So let's go to four decimals. So something's wrong with this. That can't be right. Double check on that one because it should be really close to that 0.82. It should be pretty darn close. But this is why I'm not going to put that on the test. It's too easy to make a mistake typing all that hard stuff in. Yeah, this should be 0.8 something. So where does it actually say to go to P2? I'm just I'm missing that. Right here, find the quadratic approximating polynomial. Oh, so when it says the quadratic, it means go to P2? Yep. Okay. Yeah, the linear approximation is P1, the quadratic approximation is P2, the cubic approximation is, okay. is uh, P3. Okay. And on the test, quite frequently, or a lot of times what we'll say is, find the first four non-zero terms of the Taylor series. Mm -hmm. So the first four non-zero terms, one, two, three, four, and then it goes on forever. How crazy are the functions you're going to give us? Because some of the homework problems, it was like, I had to do 10 derivatives. Right? No. <laughs> no. Not zeros, no. Yeah. Oh my There's God. not going to be zeros that cause you to have to keep going with more derivatives. Okay. No. That is the most annoying thing an hour on one when you start getting zero. So like, Number two of the homework. Oh. Yes, my God. That took me an hour. I did yeah. my eighth derivative. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> do you come up with another approximation, Natasha? No. OK. 
Like we'll just go with point eight. <laughs> <laughs> point eight's fine. Point eight's fine. Whoa! Whoa! Whoa. 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 <laughs> I haven't even made the test yet. I should have a two versions. Matthew's version. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this thing, we're not going to do this one. We're going to talk about it. Well, maybe we'll do this one. But we're not going to do it the way they're implying to do it. So this is what we would do with a binomial series. Right? So a binomial series, you could do it with the Taylor construction process. You could take a bunch of derivatives, plug in the center of uh, center at zero. So you could do that like we just did. But the way that we would do it, now that we know the binomial series, we would do this with the binomial series. So let's at least set this up. Well, maybe we won't go all the way through it. Maybe we will. <laughs> so what is the p-value? Negative one fourth. Or one fourth. So, so the p-value is negative one fourth. So p equals negative one fourth. And so we would need to figure out what all these binomial coefficients are. Now, let me first point out that the binomial series is in it with one plus x. So if it's one plus x, we would do negative one fourth choose zero plus negative one fourth choose one times x plus negative one-fourth choose two times x squared plus et cetera. Everyone with me? <laughs> p choose zero, p choose one, p choose, it looks a lot like the geometric series except that we have those binomial coefficients. You could still do the derivative correct if you had to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what, how would I convert this if I wanted this to be 1 minus x to the negative 1 fourth? What do we replace the x with? Minus x. So it's going to be, well, the only difference is that we will actually turn this into an alternating series. Because every place that we have an odd power on the x, that will lead to a minus sign. So that would be the power series. So let's figure this out. Negative 1 fourth choose 0 is 1. There's only one way to pick 0 things out of a bag. And then negative 1 fourth choose 1. That's always the p-value. So that's negative 1 fourth times negative 1 is positive 1 fourth x. And now we start getting to the ones where we need to do some work. So negative 1 fourth, if we subtract 1, what do we get? Negative 5 fourths, and that's going to be over 2 factorial. So that will be 5 over 32. So that is going to be this coefficient, plus 5 over 32 x squared. And let's go one more, because we usually do first four non-zero terms. You can generally see good patterns if you go to four terms. So now we would have negative 1 fourth, negative 5 fourths, and negative 9 fourths over 3 factorial. So let's see, what's that going to be? It's going to certainly be negative. And uh, let's see, so in the denominator here, 4 times 4 is 16, times 4 is 64. So we're going to have 64 times 6 when we look at this denominator and that denominator. And in the numerator, we have 45. 9 times 5. OK, so 3 goes into there twice. 3 goes into there 15 times. That is going to leave us with negative 15 over 128. That is the final term that we are going to find. Negative 15 over 128 times x plus Say that once again. You have a negative on the uh, series canceling out the negative 15. Right here? Oh, because that's a minus. 
So that's going to be minus, right? Because this minus, I, when I replace the x with negative x, the odd powers have a negative one in front. So that negative is going to cancel with that negative. Thank you. So actually, this series will not alternate. It's always going to be positive because of that offsetting negative. Yeah. Wait, what just said? So what was that? <coughs> so when we went from here to here, we replaced x with negative x. Uh -huh. So all the x's turned into negative x. And so this is, anytime we had an odd power, that minus had to factor out to the front. This next term is negative. So this term is negative with an x cubed in it. And so that oh, negative right oh. there is going to multiply with that negative and make that positive. Okay. Yeah. I, why is it positive on the, right before the third term? Is it going to be negative as well? When you put a negative x into here, the even power is just going to wipe out the negative. Oh. Right, so if you put negative x into an even power, it's still just negative 1 to an even power, which means the negative 1 turns into a positive 1. So that is our power series. Now, this p-value dictates what we get for our interval of convergence. We don't go figure out the interval of convergence for a binomial. It's negative 1 to 1, and we include <coughs> and exclude the endpoints based on the... Uh, Let's see, do I have that thing still pulled up? Right here. Oh man, it's probably gone. <coughs> it's like, oh, it worked. Miracle. So P series, so binomial series here. P was in between zero and negative one. It was negative one fourth. So we include the one and exclude the negative one. So the interval of convergence is negative 1 to 1. Oh, let's be careful. Let's be careful. Let's be careful. Because we did, a, we did do a substitution, right? So the, P, so the interval of convergence right here, oh no, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So this is strictly based on that. So all we have to do is look right at that p-value. That p-value is negative, so we have this. There's nothing fishy. Nothing weird. So do you care if we actually reduce the factorial and all of that? Together? No, not at all. So if we left the factorial in there and didn't reduce the fraction? Although, so this, are we talking about these coefficients? So like, yeah, if you, if you left that, instead of doing 3 times 2, you just left it as? 3 factorial? 3 factorial. And, and you still did the, the numeric. Totally fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In general, it's not a huge deal if you don't simplify the coefficients. With a binomial, we usually do because with a binomial, there's no way to come up with a pattern. So with the other ones, we intentionally don't simplify the coefficients because if we want to create a summation notation, you need to see all the factorials and all the powers and not simplify them if you want to find the pattern. But a binomial has no pattern. The binomial, this is the pattern right there. That, these coefficients. There's no other way to write it. So that's why usually with a binomial, that's the one case with a power series that we usually do simplify the coefficients. Usually. But it's not a huge deal if you don't. Okay, so let's go to this one. This one looks familiar. I helped a few people yesterday with that. Let's do it the most efficient way possible. For an interval of convergence, you can use the ratio test, which is what we do most commonly, but you can also use the root test. They do the same thing. And this is very easy to find the kth root of. So let's do the root test on this. So we're going to do the kth root of 15kx to the k. Well, those k's just cancel, so we're left with the question, what is the limit of 15 kx. And I made one minor mistake there. We have to have an absolute value. So let's put that in there. Have to have an absolute value because we have an x. So the x doesn't depend on k, so it can come all the way to the front. And then we're left with this little thing. So 15 absolute value of x. What's the limit of k? Okay. Okay. 
As k goes to infinity? Infinity. Yeah. Infinity. Yeah. Infinity, <laughs> times <laughs> infinity times 15x is infinity. So this limit is infinite. Is that ever less than 1? No. 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 So that means we have divergence everywhere except Origin. the center, which in this case is 0. This is a power series centered at 0. So there really isn't an interval of convergence in the conventional sense. The interval of convergence is just a point. It's just zero. Not really an interval. What's the radius of this? Zero. Zero. Yeah, so every power series converges at its center. Let's make sure that that's 100% clear. You'll be hosed if you don't get that. So if you look at this, what is the center of this power series? Zero, right? If it wasn't zero, you would see things like, like this, right? This one is centered at one. You'd see all these parenthetical x minus the center things. So this is centered at zero, 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 one. So if you plug in zero here, doesn't everything turn into zero? If you plug in zero here, everything turns into zero except the first term. When you plug in the center, the tail becomes zero. Everything becomes zero except maybe the very first term. Right here, the center is one. If you plug in a one for the x's, you end up with zero all the way through. So you can see all of these converge for their center. The center of this one is zero. If you plug in zero, everything turns to zero. Plug in zero here, everything turns to zero except the first term. Plug in zero there, everything turns to zero but the first term. So every power series converges at its center. That's the least you can have is the center. The least number of points where it converges is one, its center. So it has to converge at its center. Um, so this one does converge at its center and that's it. So pretty worthless power series if it only converges at one point. Because the whole idea is to try to build a function that's approximating. And that, this one is just not that interesting. Only converges at one point. OK, here's a more traditional one. Determine the radius and interval of convergence for this power series. Now, we wouldn't want to use the root test here. The only time we use the root test for a power series is if you really do have that perfect setup where there's a k power. So definitely want to use the ratio test here. Limit its k goes infinity of. First, we do x sub k. We do a sub k plus one. So when we plug in k plus one, we get two k plus three. Plug in k plus one there, we get k, absolute value. And then we flip the denominator up to the numerator. Numerator down to the denominator. So that is our setup that we need to evaluate. So what do we think? Where is there an extra five? Uh, top right. Huh? Top left. Huh? Bottom. It'll be a bottom or one fifth? Bottom left. Extra right. Five, isn't that five k minus one? Five k. That is one less five than this. Oh, okay. Keep going. Sorry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so there's one extra five in the denominator. Everyone else agree with that? Is, is that? Is that, is that clear? Uh oh. We need a break. OK, and then how many extra x's are in the numerator? There's two extra. Two. So that's what we have. And now, is there a k in there? No k. No k, which is fine. That's what we want. We want the k's to be gone. The limit of a constant is itself. x is constant with respect to k. As k changes, x just does what it's going to do. Has no, k has no effect on x. So there we have it. Now, I know we don't need that absolute value bar there because it's a square, but let's just leave it for now. So we ask ourselves, hey, what are the x's that create a fractional value here less than 1? 
What x's can we plug in there? Well, that leads us to, if we multiply both sides by um, 5, leads us to this. And then we can pull the square out of the absolute value. That's legitimate. Absolute value squared. We can now take the square root of both sides. And now we can turn this into a compound inequality. So we have that. Now we know the bounds of our interval of convergence. We know the goalposts. We know that we're between negative root 5 and root 5. We could identify the radius of convergence at this moment. That would be root 5, half the total length of the interval. What do we have to do next? Test it. <laughs> our favorite part, right? Test the endpoints. OK, so we have to test the two endpoints. So we're going to come down, we're going to test x equals minus square root of 5. I'm going to write this as minus 5 to the 1 half, because we're going to have to do some combining of exponents. It'll be a little bit easier if we have a rational exponent. OK, so let's come up here. So we have x to the 2k plus 1. There's x to the 2k plus 1 and divided by 5 to the k minus 1. So there's our series. First thing I'm going to do is pull off the switch part of it. And in fact, let's just write that all by itself out in front of the sum and. So we have minus 1 to the 2k plus 1. Now, let's just look at that switch for a moment. Is it really a switch? No, it stays odd. It stays odd. That exponent stays odd. So that means it's really just a minus 1. All right? 2 times any number is even. Any even number plus 1 is odd. So this is always odd. So this is going to turn into just a negative sign out in front of the summation. OK, let's look at the other part of this. So here, we have 5 to a power to a power. So we have to multiply the powers. So in the numerator, that's 5 to the k plus 1 half. And multiply 1 half times 2k plus 1. 1 half times 2k is k. 1 half times 1 is 1 half. And in the denominator, we have 5 to the k minus 1. So the switchy looking thing became just a minus. Now we have powers of 5, so we subtract the exponents, numerator minus denominator. k minus k, 0. 1 half minus minus 1 half is 5 to the 3 halves. Everyone see how we subtract? 5 to the a divided by 5 to the b is 5 to the a minus b. Converge or diverge? Diverge by? P series. Not p series. There's no k in there. It's a constant. So if we call that our a sub k, the limit of that is not equal to 0, which implies divergence by the divergence test. All right, let's take a look at this second endpoint. So here we have, uh, instead of a negative 5, we're just putting in a positive 5 to the 1 half, 2k plus 1 over 5 to the k minus 1. So very similar. We're going to try to combine the 5s in a moment. That will be 5. Again, we, just, we multiply the 1 half across, so we get k plus 1 half. And in the denominator, we have 5 to the k minus 1. So once again, we subtract denominator exponent from numerator. We get 5 to the oh, same thing. 
three outs. So what's our conclusion there? Yeah, so diverge at both endpoints. So diverge by divergence test. Okay, so our interval of convergence. Where were we? Ah, right there. So therefore, a big therefore is that the I does not include the endpoints. That will be our interval. Good? Or just not as bad as it could be. <laughs> okay. Natalie says yes. Let's go. Let's go. All right. How do we find a power series for this function right here? What do we replace that k with? Or that x with? 11. So x gets replaced with 11x. So all we do is that. Starts at 0. The original interval of convergence is minus 1 to 1. How do we find the interval of convergence for this? Replace x with 11x. So these ones are pretty easy. So negative 1 over 11x. So our interval of convergence excludes both endpoints. Have that. So when we're doing a substitution, no biggie. We substitute, and then we substitute into our x value for the interval of convergence. Don't have to test endpoints. What a relief. So pretty easy when we're just doing a straight substitution. So we don't have to test the endpoints because it's substitution, not because it's integration. I thought substitution was the same. So substitution compositions are the same. Is it not what we no. So we test if we take a derivative or an integral. If we just do a substitution, we don't have to test endpoints. Okay. Or if we multiply by a power of x. So here, we're going to multiply by a power of x. So we have the power series for natural log of 1 minus x. We're going to multiply by 3. We'll leave the 3 on the outside. And we'll put the x to the 9 on the inside. This one starts at 1. This interval of convergence does not change at all. When you have, if you multiply by a power of x, it doesn't change the interval of convergence. Think about the ratio test. The ratio test is a sub k plus 1 over a sub k. If you increase the numerator power of x by 9 and you increase the denominator power of x by 9, they just cancel out. The effect of multiplying by a power of x, when you go to the ratio test, you see, oh, it all just cancels anyway. When you do a sub k plus 1 over a sub k, you end up with 1x in the numerator, regardless of you multiply top and bottom by you know, an extra power of 9. It doesn't matter. So when you multiply by a power of x, i doesn't budge. Endpoints don't have to be tested. Nothing changes. So that's even easier than substitution. You multiply by a power of x. But then if we replace the x with power of x, then we have to test. So if we replace the x with a power of x, that's different than multiplying by a power of x. Yes, absolutely. And that is what we're going to do here. Okay, so we are so well versed in the geometric series. We know that the geometric series is x to the k, k starts at 0. And we know that the interval of convergence for this is minus 1 to 1. No surprises. Now what are we going to replace x with? Yeah negative 7x squared. So 1 over 1 plus 7x squared 
we come in here and we're going to replace this, this x with negative 7x squared. So then over with the i, we have to go over here and we have to replace the x with negative 7x squared. We can divide by negative 7. We have that. <clears throat> now here things get a little fishy. You can convert this back into absolute x squared less than 1 7. That's how you go back and forth between a compound inequality and an absolute inequality. You've seen that. Usually we're going this direction. If we have the absolute value of something, we turn it into this inequality. But you can do it that way. And the reason that we have to go back here is that then we can pop the square out. Then we can take the square root of both sides. And then we can go back to this interval-ish looking inequality. But you can't just do it here. You can't take the square root of both sides here because that side's negative. But you can squeak around it by doing that. Pretty sneaky. What if we had greater than and then greater than or equal to? There's another one on here with that. Okay. The answer is that everything becomes greater than or equal to. Okay. Because if it's if it's an even power, if it's an even power. Yeah, so if we were right here, and this, and we had this, like that. Um, let me put a different color there. So if we had something like that, uh, we can, we'd have this, we'd have this, we'd have this, and then both of those. So we would have one modification is that you would increase the convergence at one endpoint. We'll, we'll see one where we do that in detail, but yeah. It's a good question. OK, so now the hard part. So it's pretty easy. We just did substitution and then modified our interval of convergence. Now the hard part. How do we get to G from F? We would love a power series for G. And to get a power series for G, we need to modify the, oh, holy smokes. We need to modify the power series for F. Are we differentiating or integrating to get to G from F? I mean, <laughs> so if we look at F prime, so F prime, it's a ratio, so we'll do uh, um, quotient test, quotient rule. Low D high is zero, minus high D low over low squared. So there's our derivative. It's not quite G, but it's close. If we divide both sides by negative 14, we divide both sides by negative 14, then we have x over 1 plus 7x squared squared. And isn't that exactly G? So this is the formula that tells us how to get a power series for G. This says to get a power series for G, Take the power series for f prime and divide by negative 14. So we have the power series right here for f, right? This is f of x right here. This is the power series for f. All right. So this tells us then, let's go g. So g is going to be negative 1 14th times f prime. To get f prime, we look right there. f prime is going to be k times negative 7x squared to the k minus 1 times negative 14x. That is the power series. Let's get our indices straight. This is 0, so this was just a replacement, so it's also k equals 0. When we take the derivative, should this be k equals 0 or k equals 1? k equals 1. If we plugged in 0, we would have x to the negative 2 here. x to the negative 2 times x is x to the negative 1. That's no good. If we plug in 1, this is 0, and we get a power of 1. So 
that is g of x. There is the power series for g of x. And we could do a little simplification here, but this is g. Now, to find the interval of convergence for g, we take the interval of convergence for f, but what do we have to do when we differentiate or integrate? Test the endpoints. So we would now need to test these endpoints. And we don't have any more time, so we'll stop here. I'll just finish this before I close out the notes and write down the interval of convergence by testing those two endpoints. If you want to hang around, you can. If not, so there are still some more uh, questions on here we didn't get to. What I'll do is uh, work goes out, and I'll just put them in here today so that you have them. Okay. Fiddle with them. I'll, at least, I'll do most. Maybe I won't do all of them if there's some duplicates, but I'll do most of them. All right. Big test Thursday. Good luck studying. That's crazy. And then we have break for two for a week, and then we only have two weeks after that. Yeah. Wow. How in the world so, <laughs> this is this the end of week 13? It's okay. So just the endpoints? Yeah, we'll test those endpoints. You plug them back into the... Plug them back into the series for X prime.